it's no secret. I love the Euronymph, but I know over the years, I've made just a few mistakes, and we're gonna call those the seven deadly sins of European nymphing. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Camisa from Trout and Feather. Follow along as I share six of the sins that I've definitely committed. Then I'm gonna bring a special guest on at the end to share number seven. Stay tuned. I don't care if you're talking about European nymphing, nymphing, dry fly streamers, there are mistakes that I have made over the years. I mean, I've been doing this for over 30 years. I've made lots of mistakes and I will continue to make more. However, I wanna share with you many of the mistakes that I made when it came to European nymphing that I didn't even realize I was doing wrong at that time. These mistakes are in no particular order, but I hope you can connect with them and share additional ones that I missed down below in the comments section. When I first started European nymphing, I committed the deadly sin of fishing flies that were too heavy. I mean, I was told about this check nymphing, so I figured I had to get these super heavy flies. We're talking like size 12 with 0.020 lead wire wrapped around it. These three millimeter tungsten beads. I would fish two of those and just dredge the bottom. Cause I figured like that's where the fish were. They were just living around these rocks, just waiting for this fly to come dragging the bottom and just gobble them right up. And gosh, that is just, does that happen? Sure, you could talk about the winter time, maybe in some slow moving pools, but we're talking about fishing for trout, for char, for fish that want to look up. They want to eat flies as they're drifting naturally in the current. Whenever you're dredging the bottom, that's not natural at all. You don't have a Pat's rubber leg that's just crawling downstream along the bottom. It doesn't necessarily happen like that all the time. So I want my flies to look a little bit more natural. I don't wanna dredge them. In fact, the rule that I now use whenever I'm fishing, I go with the lightest nymph possible. I mean, think about this time of year. It's early summer in Pennsylvania when I'm filming this. The fish wanna be looking up. They wanna see insects. Every now and then I'll see fish rising. That means they're not looking down. They don't have their nose buried down into the stream bottom. They wanna look up, so try fishing a little bit lighter patterns. But make sure as you're making those casts, those flies are almost bouncing along the bottom or just slightly rising a little bit higher up in the water column. But what happens when our flies are going too fast? Well, that's unnatural and that's another deadly sin of Euro nymphing. We don't want our flies just accelerating and rocketing through our drift. So we do have to slow them down. So we're trying to find that balancing act so we can get our flies slow enough so that they appear more natural, but not so slow that they're just gonna drag on the bottom and potentially get snagged. How do we accomplish that? Whenever we look at our flies, we can see how much weight is built into those flies. I have a bunch of flies in my boxes on my pack right now. And those bead sizes of those tungsten beads, man, they will vary from even as small as one and a half millimeters, the whole way up to 4.5 millimeters. I mean, that is heavy. So I will kind of make that decision on how fast I want my fly to go. The other thing, we can kind of have some supplementary materials added to our flies. If I have a paragon, I mean, that's Spanish for a pellet. It's gonna sink to the bottom. However, if I go with a little bit of soft tackle wrapped around that CDC, then it's gonna slow my fly down a little bit. I did a video with Devin Olson of Tactical Fly Fisher, and we talked all about the four different styles of nymphs and how he really organizes them throughout his box to depend on how fast he wants them to sink. It's a very important concept. What else can we do? Well, it's simple. Whenever I make my cast and I have my fly out there, I control the angle that my tip at my leader goes into the water. Now think about this. If I keep my, my fly rod and the leader straight above, just like literally overhead of that fly, it's gonna allow that fly to get to the bottom in a hurry and just bounce along the bottom really slow. But if I keep a low rod angle and I keep my tippet angled really far in front, that's gonna pull my fly off of the bottom. You ever come across me fishing on the water, I am constantly adjusting my angle of my rod. If I wanna slow it down, my rod's a little bit higher up in the air. If I wanna speed it up, I'm gonna adjust the angle that way. So adjusting my rod will really help the speed of my fly as it comes through the drift. But there's one additional thing I can do to either slow it down or speed it up. And that depends on my cast. I love to make this cast that's called a tuck cast, where I basically am gonna be accelerating and stopping higher up in the air. By doing that, it's gonna force my flies to kick around and insert in the water before my leader comes down. However, if I stop the tuck higher in the air, those flies will shoot down faster than if I tuck slower. What if I don't do a tuck at all? Then they're basically just gonna unroll a little bit more naturally, and as soon as they hit the water, they're going to start their drift. So depending on where I stop my tuck, that will also speed up 
or slow down my flies. You can see European nymphing, there is a lot to really think about. And those are two of the, the deadliest sins out there, going too slow or going too fast. My wife, Heather, loves to be in the outdoors. So do my children. Whenever she decided that she wanted to learn fly fishing, I was kind of excited to teach her. I mean, you know how that kind of goes, teaching your significant other how to fly fish. But I had to make that decision. Do I go with traditional fly line or European nymphing? Well, I chose the latter. And as I started watching her, as I was teaching her, one of the most common mistakes that she made was one that I made as well. And it's a deadly sin of European nymphing. She would cast out her line, her fly would go in the water, she would let her tippet go onto the water, and then her leader would also go onto the water. So her entire cast would kind of roll out there, it, would, it was all in the water, and what would she do? She would pick up her line, she would pick her leader off of the water, so just her tippet was going down to her fly. That sounds right, doesn't it? No, it doesn't, because as she's picking up her leader off the water, it's pulling her flies out of the drift. So what does that mean? How did I help her correct that? How did I help myself correct it? Because that's a sin that I committed as well. Well, it's really simple. As I make my forecast, as I have her make her forecast, we stop a little bit higher in the air so that only our fly and our tippet goes into the water. We don't want our leader touching that water at all. I don't want my tippet ring going in the water at all. Are there instances where it's really deep and I'll let my tippet ring and my leader go in? Sure. What about if I'm floating the leader and I'm using my leader as an indicator? Absolutely, it's gonna ride on the water. But if I'm gonna be leading my flies or letting them drift as natural as possible when I'm European nymphing, the only thing going into the water is my fly and my tippet. That leader, I don't want it touching that water. That's a deadly sin, don't commit it. Before going any further, be sure to like this video so I know you wanna see more like this, especially taking up my fishing time. I wanna be out fishing. Instead, we're talking about the deadly sins of Euro nymphing. What about strike indicators? So many fly fishers, when they get into Euro nymphing, they think about that competitive angle because there are so many fly fishers, like Devin Olson out there, like my special guest to come, that are into the competitive scene and they're not allowed to use this floating strike indicator, like a bobber. They can't use that, it's not allowed in their regulations, but we can. And so many people that I see, they wanna be fishing, we'll say further away. So what do they do? Well, they walk closer to the fish. What do I do? I'm gonna use something like a micro thin leader and I put a strike indicator on for two purposes. Number one, that's gonna add some additional weight. That additional weight will help me lob it over and cast it further. That's a good thing. Number two, once it lands, I can then pick up my micro leader the whole way to my strike indicator. Now I have a direct connection with my strike indicator and I'm not gonna be pulling it back, especially if I have a micro thin leader that I'm using when I'm nymphing. If I'm not pulling that strike indicator back, then it's gonna stay in that one drift where I want it. However, if I'm Euro nymphing and I've seen many people do this and I committed this sin too, and I wanna cast my flies, my nymphs, as far as I can, I make that cast with that nice oval cast and I get them out there and it starts drifting downstream and I start to see my line kind of coming towards me. That's unnatural. I'm pulling my flies across the drifts. So don't be afraid to throw in that strike indicator to keep them in the drift. I have a video out there on all the strike indicators I love to use. Check out that video and know that I use it with my Euro nymphing setup. In fact, my tip is whenever I use that strike indicator with my system, I don't put that strike indicator on my leader. I actually go from my leader to my tippet ring, then I start my tippet. I'll put that strike indicator maybe two to three inches below my tippet ring on my tippet. That way I can hold all of my leader off the water, go back to that last deadly sin. I don't want any leader on the water. I have direct connection to my strike indicator, which has direct connection with my tippet and the flies. Try that out, you will love that little tip. If you're into social media, be sure to use that hashtag trout and feather so I can see what you're posting about and I can learn basically where you're fishing, what you're fishing, the flies you're tying, all that fun stuff. Come on, where do you think I'm gonna get my future video ideas from? All of you with that hashtag trout and feather. But be sure to add trout and feather on whatever social media platform you use. I'd love to connect with all of you there. All right, here's a big one. This is a, a sin that I've committed when I've been Euro nymphing and it's that I've been fishing a nymph for maybe a dry dropper and then I decided I wanna throw a streamer. So what do I do? I trim one of my nymphs off. I put on a big streamer, it will say a size six or a size eight streamer. I make a cast, I hook a fish and it pings away. What happened? Well, what happens is really simple. I tend to run 6X or even 7X when I'm Euro nymphing. Whenever you tie 6X or 7X to a really big hook eye, a streamer hook eye, there's just too much going around there. Depending on the knot that you tie, it's more prone to snap off. What should I have done? Really simple. 
I should have taken a couple minutes, snipped off that piece of tippet, rolled it up, put it in my pocket, saved it for later, and then tied on a piece of 3X, 3.5X, 4X, use something like my favorite Honic fluorocarbon tippet, put on a larger size, then throw that streamer. Once you're done throwing that streamer, go back to your smaller size tippet. Now, for those of you out there who have my book, Fly Tying for Everyone, you already know one of my favorite streamers, it's my jig streamer. I mean, it looks just like a bugger. I mean, I call this one Uncle Bugger. How can you not love this fly? It's just beautiful. What do I fish that one on? Well, it depends on the size I tie it. That's a smaller streamer. I'll fish that one down to a size 12. So can I use it on 6X or 5X? Absolutely. Just make sure you know that if you're gonna be changing to a much larger fly, you have to change your tippet accordingly. What's another deadly sin I committed with European nymphing? Well, it relates to techniques. When I first learned this style, I went with my favorite fly at the time, a paradigon. And I would find fast water and I would fish that paradigon and I caught fish. Life was good. So then every time I came to really fast water in this specific looking type of water, I would put on a paradigon and I would catch fish. Then I'd go down to this pool and what would I do? I would change my whole rig over, go back to a system that I knew before, like a strike indicator, some split shot, catch some fish, keep moving through the, the water, go further downstream or upstream. Oh, there's another fast water. Let's put on my paradigon and fish that technique again. Oh, I'm back to European nymphing. Gosh, I have learned since that time that there are so many different niches within European nymphing. I can do them all with one leader and one setup. And that's something I didn't know at first. I felt like it was only for fast water with these flies like paradigons. Now, no more. I mean, I fish flies like waltz worms with CDC, Pat's rubber legs, squirmy wormies, eggs. There are all kinds of flies. You name it, I love to fish them. How about dry flies? Yes, I fish them with this European nymphing style. No, I'm not nymphing a dry fly, but I can fish in a variety of different water types, a variety of different speeds, all using that same setup, and I just have to make some adjustments along the way. So I was most comfortable fishing that fast water first with those flies that really just sank in a really short amount of time. What did I realize the next step was to do? Well, for me, I realized there was this technique called floating your leader. So I wanted to find out more about floating my leader. I learned that technique, floating the leader. You're probably like, what does that mean if you're not to that level yet? I have a whole video on leaders. You'll see it right now. But if you want to know basically the perfect leader that I tie myself for floating the leader, shoot me an email at tkamisa at gmail.com. Tell me that you like that leader. I will send you that leader. And you can thank me for it afterwards. Then I realized I could fish strike indicators, as I told you. So I started fishing strike indicators off of the system. Then I realized I can do this thing called a dry dropper. So I started using a dry dropper and figuring out which situations to use those. So yeah, do you have to learn more with this European nymphing? Absolutely, but you're gonna catch more fish in a variety of places and that's what makes this wonderful. There are so many resources out there aside from YouTube. I'll list some below down in the description of this video, but by all means, check out some of the other resources in Euro Nymphing because there are so many different techniques and styles to learn. I wanna learn them all, I know you do too. So start pushing yourself to get to that next level of Euro Nymphing. Now it's time for our special guest. All summer long, I've been filming and fishing with Carson Angeli of Happy on the Fly. His YouTube channel is down below. Carson, thanks so much for coming back. Hey, thank you, Tim. You're welcome, bud. So you love the Euro Nymph. Yes. No doubt about it. Yep. He's on Fly Fishing Team USA, the youth team. He's a great angler. I mean, one of the best fly fishers I've fished with in a long time. You're going to share a sin too. What is the sin that maybe you've committed, maybe I've committed, yeah. you can share with everybody? It's, it's basically just using one fly for the whole entire trip because you're like dialed in or you trust it so much. <laughs> well, listen, it's the worst. I talked about the Paragon. Yeah. Come on, tell everybody, what's your one fly? Mop. Oh. I, yeah, yeah. When I was younger, that was the one fly I just had had to have on the whole time. Now, what we're gonna talk about about sins or what the mistake was is not. It's not about like fishing or technical abilities or anything else like that, but using the mop constantly. So. <laughs> oh no! Wait. Do you still use the mop? Yes, I do. And, yeah. And I do too. But I now just and I'll share note like fishing with you, Carson. That's not like your go-to. When we get to a no. spot, he's not like, I'm putting on the mop right away. Are you saying before it was like, no matter where you were, that was the fly? That, that was the fly, and that was oh. the big mistake. So, for example, I would be on this tiny little stretch on Spring Creek in such Pennsylvania, and it was so shallow and things like that. I could see all the trout, and I throw that mop in there, and they all get spooked. 
And then I kind of started to realize, yeah, I should start changing my plans. <laughs> so, yeah, that that was a very bad sin of mine that I used to have, and it was just. But over time, I developed a methods of when I should use it, when I sh should not use it, and then, ever other than that, I'm still I still love it to this day. But there's just certain times that you shouldn't put it on first. Uh, that's definitely a sin. I mean, you heard mine. The Paragon was that fly that I just I couldn't get off my line. I know yeah. many people out there. Might be an egg, maybe a squirmy, maybe the mop. Sure, let, listen, let, let's also tell them, what's your yeah. favorite color? What are you gonna go with? Chartreuse green. All right, go with yeah. the chartreuse mop. It works for Carson, it works for me. We won't judge it too much if you commit that sin, but try other patterns. There's lots of other yeah. flies out there. Yeah. All right, thank you, Carson. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much, Tim. You got it. The seven deadly sins of Euro nymphing. All right, what did Carson and me forget here? Which one did I not talk about? Tell me down below in the comments. And also let me know, like, what's your experience level with European nymphing? Are you brand new to this? Are you committing all of them right now? Or is this something you've been Euro nymphing for a handful, five, six, more years than that? You've realized like, oh, here's something you've really niched down and you've, you've made that mistake. It might relate to casting. It might relate to leaders. I would love to hear your thoughts down below. Don't stop the fun yet. Even though I probably committed six of those deadly sins today while steelhead fishing, I'm gonna get back out there. But before I do, click this link right here. I put all those videos I talked about in a playlist just for you. Click here, you can thank me later.